war does make a difference. But you look at Brazil, it's just over $2. And again, that means you can probably find a, an install for about a dollar. But that's an important thing to consider. The days of being able to put your game up and figure that you can tweet it, and all of a sudden you're going to get 100,000 people playing your game in 10 minutes, not happening. And looking at Android, there's a reason that Android, you know, costs two-thirds less or a third less than an iOS. And that's because an Android user spends about 75% less per transaction than somebody in the App Store. Which goes back to, how are you guys getting paid? These are pretty typical in-game transaction store windows. This actually is from Zuby, buying characters. And this is from a friend of mine studio, client studio buying in-game currencies so you can get a better deck of cards and be more effective. So when I, I teach game production and studio startup at the University of Southern California, and I think that you know, one of the biggest things that we fail in our program to do is stress the business side of the business, and that in reality, running a game studio is the ultimate RTS. So for those of you who love Command and Conquer, enjoyed the original Blizzard games, love Frozen Throne and the World of Warcraft, you should excel at being a studio head. You're not going to get great animations per se, and you're not going to have cool explosions, but you're going to have to manage resources in real time with real money in a very finite compressed period of time. Almost Dota-like. So game studios, like games, have rules. So in looking at defining a game, it's rules and systems that prompt an outsider to take actions and interactions with a finite series of outcomes. And as a studio, it's truly, those are your rules. You're going to have a finite number of decisions that you're going to be able to make and outcomes. So as an independent studio, you need to know these things, otherwise don't bother. I know it sounds stupid to say you should know what you're building, but I can't tell you how many young studios I go into with an investment group and the designer and lead engineer can't articulate exactly what they're building, why, why it's going to be fun, and what they expect it to do. And that's because they have scoped a game that only Activision could attempt to find a studio to do. They don't have the money. And they're not really sure because they've never built anything like that. So if you've never built a game as a team together, you need to look at how much cash you have, how much human resource you have, and go backwards and scope a design that can be built and delivered, finished, published, in the amount of time that you have. And you need to determine, basically, are you, are you publishing for yourself and you're going to take the risk and hope for the reward, or are you looking to do work for hire? Because the difference is really being a business operator or being a project manager or just a producer. And I can tell you that developing a single game is it's much easier. All you have to worry about is a few milestones and working with a handful of people, and all the tasks are finite you know the specific animation and rig need to be done on day seven. And if you're in an ongoing studio business, it's all upside down. Because you're going to end up worrying about how do you grow your studio more so than how to get the game done to ship. Because what you're shipping at first doesn't really matter. So it almost makes me want to go back to the way we used to make games and Nintendo's inspiration for the Wii. This is how we made games back in the 16-bit and early 32-bit days. Needed $300,000 worth of cash, I needed six to eight people, and I needed six months. Most of the cartridge-based games for Super Nintendo and Mega Drive cost about $300,000 to make. Yeah, Mario cost and Zelda cost a little bit more. Some of the first-party games cost a little bit more but I can tell you that 90% of the third-party games did not. 
NBA Jam cost about 600,000 US dollars, Any, if everyone remembers NBA Jam. And most of that money, half the money, went to pay for the license fees to the National Basketball Association and to pay for player likenesses. So after you got your guys together, six months later, you'd ship something at retail, you'd ship, and then your team would basically scale back. And then you'd hopefully reassign some of these people to another team. But free-to-play is completely different. It's just the opposite. You start small, and you have to figure out how fast do you need to grow, what assets do you need to grow with, and when are you going to add them. And again, because J Joe's first rule of life in games is always, be get, always get paid, always pay your team, you have to figure out whether your cash matches the timing of when you add employees. So my free play, you know, free to play fact is that it's not a genre. Free to play is not a genre. It's not like a sports game versus a free to play game. It's a design method. You should not be thinking about doing a free to play game unless a funnel and mechanics are completely synced to know that everything that the player does is geared towards maximizing your opportunities to have income. Because that's the only way you're going to get your money back. So it's not like you build your game and then figure out, oh yeah, I can't charge money for it, so now I'm going to, I'm just going to run some banner ads across the bottom and, you know, after an hour I'm going to charge two dollars. Doesn't work. It worked for about three months and then consumers basically said, nope, doesn't work for us. So I think in looking at free-to-play, there's really five things that matter. Has anyone heard these terms before? KPIs, key performance indicators. If you're looking for money from investors, whether they're angel investors, your friends and family, or venture companies, banks, they know about these things. And these are the basic barometers that people gauge whether a free-to-play game is being successful. And we spend weeks learning how to integrate design to balance to key performance indicators. Cost to MVP. How much is it going to cost you to build a minimally acceptable product that you can put on the market and test? How much is it going to cost you to go from build one to build 30? ECPA, the expected cost of player acquisition. You know you're going to have to buy installs. How much are you willing to spend for how long? Oh yeah, and how long will they stay? That's retention. What percentage of them are going to buy? Across all free-to-play games, across all the stores, it's less than 1%. And then ARPDAO, which is what investors all talk about. Average revenue per daily average unique, courtesy of our friends in the web business. So I'm going to sort of like not take you through every little aspect of that. This is the goal. So we calculate lifetime value of a player. If we know from research and testing our game in small markets that somebody will play Joe's World of Warcraft for 90 days and spend $2 over that 90 days, I better figure out how to build and deliver that game for less than $2 or no more than $2. And if I can't, I go out of business. If I can, I can start making money. Uh, our best games are inspired by what happened in real life a few thousand years ago. So the chariot races are about 700 before the common era. And they were wildly entertaining and they were wildly deadly. And publishing a free-to-play game pretty much is like a chariot race. So to help you guide the land fields as developers, uh, I would suggest that you pick up a copy of a uh, trial version of QuickBooks or something like that, or sit down with a friend who is in business school and help them, get them to help you build a business model. Because you need to know, are you making money and how much are you spending? You should be able to, as a designer, know as much about your business as anyone else, because it is ultimately your money. 
in that within my classes and the studios I consult with, I make them do exercises and tear apart their game to figure out if they can actually build what they want to do. And have a formula that basically allows you to try and test various model points, whether you have high retention or low retention, and it feeds a spreadsheet which basically tells you that, oh my goodness, after six months, I'm still burning $3,000 a month more cash than I have in the bank. So that means I have to go back and change my formula or change the game to where I have more confidence that my numbers will get better. So what does all this look like? When it's done really well, it looks like King.com's Candy Crush Saga. It's still the most popular globally free-to-play game. Up to 80 million, sometimes 90 million will play a day. They're hitting over $900,000 per day globally in transactions. And I know my wife is one of them. She lies to me about it, but I know that the only way that she is ahead of me in Candy Crush is because she's buying hammers, she's buying you know stripes and solids, and it drives me crazy. But when I got into the game business, if I could never imagine my wife being in a place to where she would spend more money on games than I do in free-to-play, in microtransaction, which is great. I mean, I'm thrilled. But I still can't get her to sit down and play GTA V. She will not play FIFA with me, even on easy mode. So again, your challenge, how do you get paid? So I have, you know, basically four simple steps. Again, you need to know what you're building and for whom. You need to know how long is it going to take you. You need to know how much money is it going to take and how much do you think it might make back because you do want to get paid. And this sort of feeds into what I call the outliers trap. Outliers. Anybody read Malcolm Gladwell's book? Familiar with the term outlier? Incredibly successful companies that don't fit the definition of what success is. The problem in young games and mobile entertainment is that people, investors, assume that all of you are going to be there. That's not real. There's one Steve Jobs per generation. There's one Angry Birds. And the thing that's most telling about all this is that these companies, these studios, Supercell with Clash of Clans, Half Brick Studios in Australia with Fruit Ninja, Rovio with Angry Birds, Telltale with Walking Dead. None of these studios ever thought that these games would be huge. Rovio had to borrow 50,000 euros to finish the game from a publisher, the only publisher who would talk to them. And all they wanted to do was finish the game and go on to the next game and hope they could live again. This was their 51st, 53rd game. Doesn't really matter. Everyone has a different version of that story. -o. Fruit Ninja was their 12th game, and they charged for it. They charged $2.99 when they first shipped Fruit Ninja on iOS, and they didn't want to, but they were broke, and they figured that they could recoup enough cash to start the next game in the first 30 days if they charged $3. They had no idea that it was going to go to connect and sell 30 million units. They had no idea they'd sell 30 million units at all or that it would monetize it the way it has. It was a small studio, eight people trying to stay in the business so they could make another game. So I would recommend, if you really want to make games, you damn well better be playing a lot of games. You need to be playing your game a lot, but you need to be playing not the top five games because it's, you're not going to learn from them. You need to play games from studios that just consistently are shipping a product every three to six months. That means they have efficient production, reasonable scope, and that they're able to monetize. Anybody here play a game called Flick Kick Football? So this is from a studio called Pickpock. Uh, they originally started as work-for-hire cartridge game developers. They've done 28 iOS and Android titles. 
All of them have made money. This is their second most expensive game. It was launched just before Christmas, Flick Kick Legends. And in the first four weeks, they installed 3.5 million copies of it. Zombie Gunship, done by four PhD engineering students with an engine technology that they did to get their thesis. They live in four different cities. The lead engineer is in Berlin, just outside of Berlin. They meet once a, they meet once a week, and they try to meet once a year face to face. But they're all on the same page. This is a game called Puzzle Juice. Tetris meets Boggle. It was done as a student project in my program at USC. Two guys in basically half a semester for the prototype. And they decided to finish it themselves after they graduated. Put it up on the App Store and no one was buying it. But the person who curates games for Starbucks for their weekly app permission saw it and thought that would be perfect for the people who come in their store. So they went from having 100,000 installs to close to 2.5 million installs in a period of two weeks by being featured by Starbucks. So yeah, serendipity, Providence smiled upon them. The important thing was is that they got the game done quickly and efficiently. And I was impressed. And this is a work for hire game that was done by Pickpock using characters from uh, the Cartoon Network's Adult Swim. That game was uh, less than 70,000 US dollars in that range. Turner was wildly excited because they made more money than they possibly could have imagined. So they made it free. All they wanted to do was test the characters and see if people like the characters. And it's a simple mechanic. It's a swipe match three with crazy animations. So game making is really hard work. I mean, but writing a novel is hard work. Directing a movie is hard work. Doing anything creative is hard. Even for those of us who believe that our creative talents make it less hard. So it always leads me to a quote from Homer. If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. Uh, and the truth of the humor is, is that I try to look in my class every semester and identify the half of the people on the class that I'm going to encourage not to be go into games, that they should express themselves in other things because they're not willing to deal with the failure and they think that your first game needs to be perfect and it's going to be a work of art. Your first game is going to, is going to be playable and it, it may not suck, but it's not going to be your best game. It'll never be your best work. So... I take a lot of inspiration, and I think a lot of people did, from Miyamoto. And he always says the obvious objective of video games is to entertain people with surprising and wondrous new experiences. And I think that's a much better goal to have for all of us. And that as creators, we always say it's about the game, it's about my idea, it's about this special interaction. But to be successful in pursuing that dream, it's really about following the rules, both the rules of making a good game and the rules of running a studio, which really comes down to knowing your target, knowing your team, so you're a good team together, and discipline. It's basically being honest with yourself, knowing when something's broken, and telling your lead engineer that he broke something and now he's got to fix it, and he has to fix it today. And so he can't go to the football match. He can't go to the pub. It is a commitment. And if you do that, then I think you can influence the chances of being successful and end up like a pickpock or a Limbic Studios. So before I say goodbye and thank you for sitting in a hot room on a Saturday afternoon, I have a personal request, and it's based on a few days of studying my history of Brazil. You know, as a country that's you know, two and a half times older than the United States. You have rich history, you have rich stories, and you have things that go on here in your popular culture that defy my imagination. But when I go to the App Store and Google Play, 
I don't see a lot of Brazil reflected in that. So I hope that over the next five years, some of you will figure out how to build and design and bring some of Brazil into your games and experiences and applications. It's not that it's imperative. I mean, obviously, when you play Angry Birds, you don't think, ah, Sweden. There's nothing Swedish about that in terms of its style or its aesthetic or its mechanics. But people now talk about it. It's a Swedish game. No, it's not. It's just a game. But there are games that have come out of Sweden, lots of things, the demo scene, that reflect their culture. So please, I'd love to see things that reflect Brazilian culture because in my short time here, in my short read, it's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I wish all of you good luck with your games and thank you very much for not getting up and leaving while I speak. And if there's time, I'm happy to answer questions. If not, uh, my email is there. Happy to answer them via email. I try to be patient. Sure. Okay. So we do have time for questions if anyone wants to ask. And let me get the magic headset. Uh, hey. Magic headset's working. So first of all, really thank you for it's working. Oh yeah, I'm going to say it in English. So first of all, thank you very much for being here. It was an awesome lecture. I was really enlightened by it. And I would like you to ask you about USC. You you do have scholarships there, and how Brazilians yeah. can apply? How does that work? Yes, anybody can apply for a scholarship. We have three different programs within the School of Cinematic Arts which focuses on game design. We have a program in the v Viterbi School of Engineering called Game Pipe, which is solely on game engineering and building game applications. We get together with the engineering school and we take our best students from game design, their best students from game engineering, and we build games. We actually, as a university, fund it. We pay students $15 US an hour over the course of a semester. Tuition as a private university is expensive. We have had, in my four years teaching it, uh, in the game design program, we've never had a student from South America. So I would imagine that uh, they will welcome that. We are a school that prides itself on diversity. We have people from a number of countries in Asia, above and beyond just China and Korea. So I think having students from Brazil, from Colombia, from Chile, whoever's first may get a scholarship, and we do offer them. Hello, Joseph. Hello, Joseph. Uh, I'd like to, to know if, if I don't want to use maybe free to play games i see that you you're, that you're talking about market share and i, uh, I see that it's a huge growing but i i'd like to know why does the games that uh, that they've developed in these days they don't don't seem like tomb raider the last redemption i see that uh that you develop the tomb raider on the road but they don't don't have the same story. Does the the people don't like more to see the story to to get into the game? Isn't isn't sellable anymore? So, the, you raise an interesting point, and it's a good question. Part of it is the change in how consumers want to be entertained in the short term, because mo smartphones, mobile phones, over the continuity of entertainment is a very short window so far. The team that built Tomb Raider, seven people, you know, it's hard to build a good mobile experience with seven people today. But what you're building in mobile is probably equal to a lot of the experiences that were in a game like Tomb Raider back in 1994 when we started development. Uh, I think the opportunity and what consumers always say in research that they're interested in is games that have more narrative 
one of the reasons why Telltale Games, The Walking Dead, has done so well is because it takes its story arcs and twists them to add action in a way that's familiar to anyone who is a fan of the television show. And it's a great example of that. Uh, of course, Telltale Games also did a game, Sam and Max, which was originally from LucasArts, which is a story-driven game. There is a narrative. There's outcomes for the characters. And there's a market for that. It doesn't, you know, there's a market for everything. The question is, can you design a narrative experience that allows your player to feel great in 90 seconds? How many of you have played World of Warcraft? Okay, as soon as you install World of Warcraft and it loads, you're rewarded. As soon as you decide whether you're going to be a warrior or a mage, you're rewarded. The first hour goes by in so in what feels like 10 seconds. There's a reason that people called it war crack. And it's because they have the best affirmation structure, the best reward structure, so that as a player, you're always feeling good. Whatever you do, even if you lose, you feel good. And then you get a bounty of riches when you've got level 35 or so, and you can really get some spells going as a mage, and you get invited to play in a clan. You know, it's like, wow, I get even more. That's what's missing from most mobile games. They make a player work too hard, and they don't want to admit that I have to be really good and reward you in 90 seconds or less. 90 seconds isn't a long time by my adult, old-fashioned standard. To my 22-year-old daughter, 90 seconds is a movie. So you have to change the rhythm. And we teach in terms of our game design experiences, basically we use what's called a beat board. And we have a wall. We don't use game design documents. Those are worthless. Absolutely worthless. Waste of time. You should be able to outline a complete game. A game like Journey was done on basically two eight-foot wide boards, whiteboards, and every day things were added to it. And you can measure your beats where action and player reaction happen and time them out before you code. So 90 seconds or less so people don't leave you. And tell a story in 90 seconds. It's like telling a good joke, which I'm not particularly good at, but it's a skill that I know that if I practiced, I would be better at it. And if I knew that I had 90 seconds to make you laugh so you'd buy another drink in the bar so I get paid, I'd figure out all my stories to have a punchline, you know, at 65 seconds and then a follow-up. So I get two laughs in the price of one. And that you can do with the rhythm and the actions of what you do in games. Hi, I have two questions. One of this is, I was reading Scott Rogers' Level Up book, and he said, when you first design Tomb Raider, it's because it's Lara Croft is a woman because you don't want to look to a man backside. <laughs> <laughs> he said that. This is a curiosity. And what advice you can give to a younger game designer? Really, a lot of what I think you should do as a young designer is what I was saying over the last 45 minutes. Send me an email and I'll send you 100 games you should play. Because you'll learn a lot from these games. You'll learn great application of mechanics and you'll start to see a pattern for reward systems and affirmations that are consistent in terms of how that works. And then within mobile entertainment, it's back to you don't have 20 minutes now to entertain someone. You have 90 seconds two minutes, depending on the time of day and what they're doing. So look at play mechanics and reactions that fit within that short period of time. And then in parallel with that, game making is a business. So you need to learn enough about business to understand cash flow, how to pay people. And if you want to come up with original ideas, and I have no idea how the legal system in Brazil works, and that isn't a joke, but most legal systems are somewhat of a joke, mine included, but you need to protect your IP. 
if you want to do business with a Chilingo, with a GRI or DNA, you better be incorporated. You need to be an entity. You don't want to do it on a personal level. Because if something goes wrong, they will sue you and your family. In America, it costs, depending on the state, about $200 to incorporate. And it's one of the things that I get probably half of my students to do within their class. And if they don't want to use something like LegalZoom in America, an online service, which is very effective, I have a number of attorneys that will do students a favor just to provide them basic protection. So the business of Game Studio is as important as the design of the game you want to make. They're not separate for you to be successful. I hope that answered your question. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hola. Hey. Thanks for your time. And uh, I want to get your comments on casual gaming versus hardcore games. Just a few days ago, just a few days ago, we had a studio from Minas Gerais, Southeast Brazil, uh, getting a deal with an investor here in Campus Party, and they created a hardcore game that is a flighting simulator. And this guy from this company, from this studio, said, we are not interested in creating casual gaming because there are a lot of titles like this, and we need to get the attention from the public that's really difficult. So what's your comments on that? Casual gaming and hardcore gaming. Well, they live in the same world in the same way that The Great Gatsby, the movie of last year, lives in the same movie theater with some hack and slash horror movie. And it actually, the hack and slash horror movies did more box office than The Great Gatsby did. We want different things as consumers. In games, we have this misnomer that you only play Call of Duty or Modern Warfare 2, and that's all you're going to play. That's not true. You want different experiences at different times. The casual player and designing for mobile is a different type of audience. And there are hardcore games that you play on a tablet or that you play on a, on a smartphone. But they're not traditionally as successful, which means there is an opportunity to do a hardcore game that can provide the same level of feedback that the most successful casual games do. And if you look at the Ubisoft and uh, Glue ports of big titles to mobile, they're pretty, they're pretty good, but they're not good for mobile unless you've got seven to ten minutes to sit down and be stationary. Not while you're sitting in line waiting for a drink at the food stand. So that's the opportunity. Kabam. Uh, people familiar with Kabam? So browser-based games? Hardcore. All, all delivered. They've raised 150 million US dollars. Big number. They're just starting to make money. And they have about 1% of their customers spending $500 a month. That's a big number. I wish I could find someone to pay $500 a month for a few of my games. So there is a market for it. Are you familiar with a game called The Room? The Room. It's from a spin-off of guys from Media Molecule, who are the team behind Little Big Planet. And they really come from Lionhead Studios, who did Fable. Um, the Room is uh, a ripoff of a game called The Seventh Guest, a gothic puzzle game with narrative. They put it on the App Store a year ago last Christmas, for seven dollars and people were buying about a hundred a day they weren't too worried about it but it was different it wasn't for a casual player they're really annoying puzzles it's the type of thing that if you're not really thinking about how to get messed with you'll want to throw your iPad across the room at a wall but Apple thought it was really cool because it was a different core game that wasn't a shooter and so they promoted it and then they started shipping inloading, downloading 7,000 a day and then they dropped the price. So I think it's done 7.5 to 8 million units at about an average price of $2.
and they've just done the sequel, The Room 2. So, core game, small audience, and the audience found it was worth it. If you play enough games and look what, what's going on, and we really didn't talk about how to find data points. There's a number of online sources, ChartBoost, Flurry, will give you some analytics, a website called Zioto, X-Y-O-T-O, uh, has analytics. They're all guesses. The only people who really know how much downloads are happening are the company's servers, Apple, Google, and the portals. Everyone else is guessing. But you get an idea. And again, don't look at the top 10. Look at games that have done 50,000 installs at $1.99. That means they made $100,000 on a platform, and they got to keep 70 of it. And that means if you can build your game for 50,000 bucks, you get your money back, a little profit, and enough to where you can hire another person and start your next game. And as young game makers, that's what you want to do. Build, publish, build again. You will become much better at it. And then people will want to give you money because you can say, well, I've got these three games that are up on the App Store now. Hi, Joseph. Um, do you still think that there is um, room for innovative interaction between the game industry and social media? Because what you see today, it's like, at least what I see today is a little bit of over and over. So do you still think that there is a chance for... Well, and I'll, even money making, because believe in the end of the day, like you said. Well, I want to get paid for what I do, and I know that you are going to want to get paid for what you do. Uh, if it wasn't for how we behave as humans, we're clannish. We like to mingle. We like to interchange with each other. It's that basic social structure that lies within humans that is at the core of why Candy Crush is success, is successful and making lots of money. Why Clash of Clans is making lots of money. So the, those are really social games. It's like playing Monopoly or Scrabble as a, as a kid on a board. You never could play those games by yourself. That's not fun. So I think at its core, that's what you know these successful games do. If you're talking about how do we, how do we use game craft the art and science of interaction to address other issues, whether it's learning or social change, you know, how to behave as an adult around the opposite sex. That's, it's needed, it will happen. I think you know, the great opportunity for game making is the advent of more women electively putting up with the bullshit of a engineering male world and taking the risk to come up and speak their own games. The best producer at Electronic Arts was a woman by the name of Lucy Bradshaw. Her background was a marketing person. She ultimately was running Maxis, is now running all the Sims. She's a gifted producer because she understood the responsibility and the importance of getting people to honor deadlines and work together, naturally, because she was also a mother of three children and running a family. And running a team and running a family aren't that different. And women, not to be sexist on any level, are gifted in being able to read nonverbal clues differently than men. We're still hunters and gatherers. And we do that very well. And that's where I see, in my class right now, I've got two women who are just knocking it out of the park. They're out there. They have very interesting ideas, and they're challenging their male counterparts in terms of what they should be doing next. So it's great to have as many women here at Campus Party showing what they want to do with games, because you'll make the difference. Um, thanks for sure. coming here. No, it's my pleasure. Um, sorry for the English. Um, I would like to ask you, you was working in the USC. Uh, uh, gaming education is very criticized in the specialist in the media. They say gaming schools doesn't actually teach what you need to become a game designer. Actually, USC and DigiPen from Headmond are 
exceptions. They always mention it at good schools. So, but, but my point is, what, uh, why this gaming education is is, is not uh, is also is so much criticized? What uh, what they need to have and what we have to keep in mind to choose a good school. So we have an old saying, old English saying, those who can't do, teach. That was the joke. If you weren't really good at something, you could probably learn enough about it to teach it to someone else and maybe they would be better. And the best game schools in the world, the best animation schools, are schools where people blend their experiences as professionals with sound teaching theory and they all share one common trait. They, they force, they command that their students deliver assets in short periods of time because the only way to learn is through building. DigiPen is not my favorite school. They have a different approach. I'm, it's not so much that I think it's wrong, it's just not something that I think stresses enough about the business of games and enough about trial and error because DigiPen sort of forces you to build something that they have a piece of. Number one, they take equity. And number two, they want you to be showing this game in IndieCade and a number of other venues. I think you should be building a game you know, and learning how to build games first and foremost because you have a story and you want to learn how to tell it and how to get an audience to respond to it. So our program, Carnegie Mellon, the Guild Hall at uh, Southern Methodist University in Texas, uh, Stanford, MIT, of course. These are, these are programs where you will see brilliant scientists and professionals who have 20 years of experience who've actually shipped games. And then you go to Michigan State, not to pick on them. They're offering an undergraduate in game design taught by people who have never shipped a title. That is, to me, open to criticism. And that doesn't mean that they don't know anything, or that they're not smart, that if they're using Tracy Fullerton's book on the theory of play and how to prototype, game design workshop, that's great. But it, I can tell you things about what it takes to make the game prototype you showed me today something that you can ship in three weeks, and I'll be damned if the person at Michigan State can do that, because he or she has never shipped anything. And it's true in animation as well. Full Sail is a great place to learn how to use tools. It's not a good place to learn how to be an animator. Hi, Joseph. Good Hello. afternoon. My name is Julia. I'm starting as a developer uh, with Android games. And I would like to know what do you use as inspiration to develop, to develop your games? Uh, you start very young, and I'm trying to, so I would like an uh, inspiration. What else? Uh, money, for example. That's important, too. So there are a couple of books that I was exposed to from someone I know in the rock and roll business, a songwriter, very famous, and I won't name drop. It's someone you would know. Uh, and so these books are what he used to re-energize his creativity. Uh, I like to do exercises in class because for me, part of it isn't the idea, it's can you present the idea to convince three other human beings, your team, that this is something that they want to spend their time on. So we do an exercise and we give, uh, I randomly break people into four-man teams and give them an assignment. I need a game concept that you can describe in three slides or three panels on a whiteboard what it is how it works, why it's fun. The, what I call the X and the Y of a game. And I'll give you one of three topics to choose from. Rescue the princess. Can you avenge your father's death? Can you eliminate hunger in the world? So for those people who always like serious games. That's it. That's, I don't care how you go from there. So you have a pretty, pretty white room to try and make solid. And I'm always impressed that I never get students who portray a linear game like Zelda, Rescuing the Princess, 
or Super Mario rescuing a princess. They have all these backstories that they can tell with a stick figure in three panels. And it's a really good exercise to do as you create as an individual or with your team. And if you send me an email, I'll send you the title of these books. I think you can probably find them online in an online library for free. They have some good exercises. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Uh, I would like to know what is the best way you think to estimate the acquisition cost and the revenue for acquisition? That's, a, that's a, an awesome, awesome, awesome question. And if I could tell you that accurately, I would have my jet waiting for me across the motorway at the airport. Um, it's, it's a range of guesses, and you fine tune. And it's why the best free-to-play developers take a very thin client and start testing it. And they test it in semi-public areas. With my mobile games for iOS, I like to do a lot of testing in New Zealand. Number one, it's English speaking. It's easier for me to read the analytics. Number two, it's a very small market. So it doesn't cost a lot to buy installations and see what happens once they install the app. Because that's what you really want to see. You can always find installs. The only question is how much. And the most important question is, if it costs you $2 to buy one, can I make sure that they'll spend enough time to where I earn my $2 back? Because if you do, then it's worth launching the game. But with your first build, you may find out that you lose people. You know, if you, did 100, if you bought 100 installs on a Monday, and Tuesday night, you look at your log in real time, and you're going, wow, there's 25 people that played. So you go back and you look, where did I lose 75 people? And your analytics will show you, well, I lost people 36 seconds in. So let's play my game. And what happened at 36 seconds? An ad window came up. Kill the ad window. Oh, by the way, free to play game designers, no advertising for the first five minutes of any first install, ever. Not even a little creepy banner on the bottom. Don't annoy me. Your job is to sell me to keep playing, not to sell me somebody else's crap. And you're not making enough money from a banner at the beginning of a game to make a difference anyways. You can add in advertising later on when you develop an audience, because you'll get a higher amount of money, and you'll get more people who will respond, making you more money still. So small client, test. See where your barriers are in your, in your funnel, how many people drop down your first three levels, and then tweak your game and go back and test again. You should spend a good month before you do a wide release of a title in any of the app stores. Because you can literally, I can go online today and buy 100 people to test my game. And I know I can post a game up on an app store in New Zealand because there's 2,000 games a month being added to it. It's not like anyone's going to necessarily find my game. So it's a safe environment. And if more people find it, you get more data. You can't lose. So thank you all for staying. Thank you for the questions. If you want to write, I do respond. And uh, if you want to learn the 100 games to play, send me the email, and I'll send you the file. So have a good rest of campus party, a good fin de semana, and obrigado. <laughs>